All right, so I'm going to give you this presentation on the balance of flexion and extension, and then I will open the floor to questions. So I'm always trying to simplify everything I do and everything I'm teaching, and uh, I, I, I'm reducing things as much as I can. And to me, the balance of flexion and extension is just a really key concept to understand what we are looking for in the simplest way to find the right posture, find the right uh, place to be in space and, and the right way to work. So, um, you know, these are these illustrations that I've made for me a long time ago and I, I just kind of love them. So when we're looking at the guy on the left, um, looking at the guy on the left, you're looking at, the balance of flexion and extension. And when you're looking at the guy on the right, you are looking at someone who is not balanced in any way, shape, or form. And one of the things about doing what I do, and you write a blog and you have opinions, and, and I'm, uh, I have been accused of being a fan of hyperbole, saying the best, and this is the, you know, I say it's a category, it's the best movie ever made, it's the best record ever made, but it's just, it's a, it's a phrase. Um, but I've been accused of hyperbole and I know I say everybody tucks their pel pelvis when well, not everybody tucks their pelvis. I'm married to a woman, a woman who doesn't tuck her pelvis. Um, so I use generalities and I know that's maybe not the best way to do it, but you know, 53 years later, um, I am hyperbolic. What are you going to do? So, uh, why I bring that up is I got an email. I, so you write a blog and you put yourself out there and you say something, you have your, Opinions and I got an email from somebody who was just not amused He was not interested in what I had to say and he said I'm I'm trying to do this on um, In private rather than public and proceeded to tell me what an idiot I was and how none of his clients stand the way I um, say everyone stands and he has pictures to prove it and it's very funny when you get those emails because you have a choice to disregard it or do you say thank you or what do you do, you know? And so I sort of let that one go because, um, well, this is just this tone. Um, so again, you know, maybe I'm not right, but maybe I am right. So what I think is going on is, I didn't want to do that, uh, that the essential difference that you have here is I do think that everyone looks like the guy on the left, right? Um, I think that the guy on the left, I mean, I've, I think everyone looks like the guy on the right. And the guy on the right, uh, and, and we could talk about this a bunch over time, but everyone perceives that they are leaning forward when they're leaning backwards. And that's that gets into the perception. And if this gentleman who, with, who emailed me does have photos, I'd be happy to see them because I look at people and day in and day out, whether it's clients, whether it's yoga students uh, or in workshops. And from my perspective, the, the, the posture of the gentleman on the right is almost everyone's posture that I work with. And I am trying to get people from some version of the guy on the right to become the guy on the left. Right. That is like my life's work is so the red line we're looking at down the skeleton is the plumb line of the body. And that line would like to pass through the ear, through the head of the arm bone, through the um, outside of the pelvis and down through the knee and through the ankle. So I have a little tool here that I want to see if I can get going. That's why I keep skipping because the the tool thing doesn't want to work. All right, I'll figure that out going forward. Uh, it's a mouse mouse tool that allows me to annotate stuff uh, to point. So maybe you don't think you're the person on the right, um, and over time, because we'll talk about posture in every single lesson, we'll throw a little bit of walking in every lesson, right? You will be. I will. You can go live on video and we can look at this and we can uh, look at anyone who, who is really interested in doing it and 
You can send in pictures. It's probably an easier way to do it if you want to have your posture analyzed by me in these calls. If you send in pictures of your posture, I am really happy to do that. Same thing with analyzing uh, your walk. I work with a really cool um, software that lets me analyze um, the way people walk. That's uh, really neat stuff. Okay, so uh, the guy on the left is balanced. The guy on the right is not. And why? I, so I'm saying this is how so many people are standing. And, and that posture is the thighs go forward and the pelvis tends to be pulled forward, not always tucked under, but it tends to get pulled forward. So that's a negative. And often in the pull forward, it gets tucked under. Um, it can get pulled forward and stuck out too far. It's just not what I see all that often. But I, like I said, with my wife, that's what you get. Um, but this is what I find, you know, is that the, the top of the thigh goes forward. And it, most often, this illustration doesn't do it so well. It puts people into hyperextension uh, rather than this kind of the bent knee. But that's just about the illustration. Uh, and that, that jamming forward of the thigh is what pulls people backwards in the upper back and the up the the that pull of the upper back compresses the lumbar spine and the compression in the lumbar spine uh, there's another issue I have with this image the compression of the lumbar spine is um, usually forces the head up uh, usually forces the chin up rather than down and it shortens the suboccipital. So what tends to happen is the lower back gets short and uh, the head and the neck gets short. And over time, I'm going to have more facility um, with Zoom and be able to just, you know, find images that I want uh, on a faster way than just a PowerPoint. So I'm sorry about that for today. So essentially what I'm teaching is that we are short in the back and long in the front. Now, I just talked earlier about how I strengthen my hamstrings. I am not short in the back. I'm not short in the back. I'm not short in the, I'm not, I am long in the front, but I'm not short in the back. I tend to have very loose, long muscles. So, uh, you know, I don't fit into the same category, but a lot of people, when I say short in the back, um, I congenitally shortened my hamstrings, even though they weren't tight and, and they never tightened up around that. Um, but I was always jamming my thighs forward and tucking under. And the lower back and the neck, the cervical and uh, lumbar spine, are they're sort of mirror images of each other. So when the thighs go forward and the upper spine gets pulled back, it's going to uh, affect both of those curves, and it compresses the lumbar, and it usually compresses the cervical as well, and it tends to get that lifted chin look that so many people have, which was my story, right? My story was incredibly tight suboccipitals my whole life from tucking under and hyperextending like crazy. I'll never forget the first time I got rolfed and they kind of ripped open my suboccipitals. It was just a, a mind blowing experience. So what we're looking at in this balance is, you know, at the front of the thigh, you have the quadricep. We'll look at all this stuff in a second. In front of the thigh, you have the quadricep, back of the thigh, the hamstring. And if they are equal in length and tone, you have the possibility of getting your legs under your pelvis and you have the possibility of getting uh, a finding good posture. It is the same thing for the rectus abdominis, the muscle at the front of the belly and the erectus spinea at the back of the spine. Uh, we tend to shorten and shrink one and quadratus lumborum gets thrown in the back. So as is involved, but they're, they're all working against the, the, uh, tone or lack thereof of the rectus abdominis, which is too long for me. And, What's really interesting is it's too long even in people with six packs very often. Not always. You know, I, I used to talk about this late night commercial of this guy who sold uh, some ab program and his six pack or his 10 pack was so intense that he was hunched over. And my joke was like, was he permanently hunched over or is he hunching to make his, uh, his pack look bigger? But I, I've worked with a number of people who have, who have very strong or hard uh, abdominals that are still too long from uh, habitually bad posture. So that's just a really interesting way to look at it. But this person is going to be long, equally long in his erector muscles of his spine, and the quadratus lum lumborum is going to have some space. The psoas will be able to set back at the thigh. Um, 
and hopefully you have a, a little knowledge around these muscles. Um, and if not, I'm happy to explain. So we go back to this gentleman and you just see this, the look at the relationship, look at, this is a, a really nice way of, um, if you, the hamstring attaches at the sit bone to the back of the knee, to the back of the shin, sorry. And that's a straight line from the sit bone to the back of the shin. And if you look at it this way, if we were to measure the length of the red line in the first image compared to the length in the second image, the second image is going to be way shorter. And that shortness becomes habitual when this is your uh, posture. And so that is one of the reasons why people have habitually short hamstrings is because just 24 seven, forget about trying to stretch them, forget about running and stretching before running. If you're standing this way 24 seven, your hamstrings are just habitually short. And so you're starting from, um, you're starting down, you know, a touchdown or however you want to look at it. All right. So looking at the front of the body, uh, there's with the front of the body, and this is a general, right, generalization. The front of the body are your flexors, right? The front of the body uh, is meant to flex, and the back of the body is meant to extend. That doesn't mean flexors don't, fle don't extend and extensors don't flex. Like uh, as a yoga example in a yoga pose, Navasana or boat pose, you know, uh, most often people are doing, are strengthening their rectus abdominis, which is the picture on the right. They're strengthening their rectus abdominis um with crunches by shortening but navasana boat pose is a way to strengthen your rectus abdominis but it's actually an extension it is not uh shortening in, in that so you know these muscles can do many things they they, they work uh, together and they work differently but they have uh main functions and these muscles that i'm going to point out now are essentially flexors the rectus abdominis flexor is something that draws uh, one piece of the body closer to another, right? So the rectus abdominis draws the rib cage to the pelvis, the pelvis to the rib cage. Interestingly, it does both of those things. It never does one or the other. Um, it's just not designed that way, which gets a little complicated when I talk about tucking and untucking, but we won't go there now. Uh, in the middle, we have your quadricep and your sartorius. And so sartorius is the picture of the, the middle picture, which is two legs. Picture on the right is sartorius, which is the longest muscle in the body. And um, so you have your sartorius, and then uh, underlying that, you have your quadricep muscles. Those are the flexors. Uh, you know, quadricep rectus femoris is one of the most troubling muscles in the whole body for me. And um, mostly it is the tendon of rectus femoris that gives us the most trouble. And we're going to talk about that a lot over time because when we lean our thighs forward like that. Rectus femoris, quadricep is four muscles, only one of which connects to the pelvis. Rectus femoris, the other four connect on the leg. Then they all meet, you know, to cross the patella and attach on the shin. Rectus femoris, which connects to the pelvis, if your, um, your posture sinks your thighs forward, you are sinking into the rectus femoris. I'll talk more about this a little later. You're sinking into the rectus femoris and you're basically asking yourself to be held up by this muscle um, and that's uh, troubling for me and anyone who suffers from what in yoga is usually you know just blanketly called hip flexor issues usually we're talking about rectus femoris and you know for sure you you are in that category if when you go to do a core to core work usually from your back the, that the cable uh, there's a cable in your hip that kind of seizes up it's incredible to watch that is literally the tendon of rectus femoris and that's what suffers most and then we're looking at the psoas muscle which is also the you know a, there's a question about whether the psoas technically is a flexor or not um but i i include it with the hip flexors and these are the parts of the body that are drawing your legs closer together psoas is never really shortening it's drawing your leg forward but that's just something we're not going to go into right now um so front of your body Flexors on the picture at the bottom is your platysmal muscle um, and your SCM, your sternocleidomastoid, um, which have sort of minor flexion. Uh, but your chin dropping, your, pl your platysma draws your chin down, and that is a flexive action. Now we're looking at the back of the body. 
Uh, gluteus maximus on the left, your big butt muscle. It is an extensor. You have three butt muscles, and, and I make the mistake of often just saying your glutes and including them, um, and that's a, a bad mistake to make. So you have three uh, gluteal muscles, gluteus maximus, which is what we're looking at, but underlying gluteus maximus, you can actually see in the, in the middle picture, there's a cutaway, and then underlying there's gluteus medius and gluteus minimus, and they are not extensors. They are internal and external rotators of the pelvis. They stabilize the pelvis, and they tend to be incredibly weak, incredibly tight. They are messed up as a re result of their relationship to the piriformis. Uh, all of these things we'll especially go into in, in our psoas month. Um, but I come back to this stuff all the time. Gluteus medius is, is a back pain muscle, right? Gluteus medius is, a, is, it's just incredible how many people I work with with back pain and things aren't working. And I said, let's do some clamshells, which is your classic gluteus medius pose. And um, very quickly, they're out of pain. It's just very different for everybody. Not everybody is served by that, but uh, when it serves you, and this gets into psoas and piriformis stuff, just digress a little bit. When the piriformis is tight, um, it's very difficult to have, to have gluteus medius and minimus working well. Um, so we'll come back to that. So gluteus maximus, the muscle on the left, is uh, an extensor, along with the hamstrings, which are the muscles in the middle, and they all attach on the sit bone, um, the, and then move down to the shin. The hamstrings are an extensor muscle. So the gluteus maximus, I talk a lot about what, what, what happened when we came up to stand. Gluteus maximus pulls down and with the help of the hamstrings, pulls down on the sit bones in the back of the pelvis to bring the pelvis up to, uh, to rotate the pelvis up to neutral with the spine stacked vertically on top. So those are extensor muscles. They are pulling us down into the floor. I'm going to talk about them a lot in terms of exercise. I think most people are not using their gluteus maximus correctly. And, and in, if you take us up on the offer for the free hamstring book, uh, I talk about that a bunch in that. Um, it's really key for me uh, to use gluteus maximus. It, gluteus maximus gets demonized in a lot of yoga where people say gluteus maximus, um, you say relax it, relax it, relax it. Uh, you do want to relax it only to use it correctly, which is you don't want to grip it and and you know, use it up towards your throat. You want to make it as an extensor. So gluteus maximus, the hamstrings, extensors of the leg. And then you're looking at, um, well, maybe you can see my mouse. Uh, you're looking at the uh, erector spinae muscles. And these are all these, not only the highlighted muscles, but these muscles, you have multifidus and the erectors, and they are literally the erectors of the spine and they are extensors. So... What you're looking at on the guy on the left is the balance of flexion and extension, right? His, his muscles are, uh, his tone, it's not about strength, his tone and length are even. His hamstrings are relatively as long as his quadriceps and his rectus has decent relationship in terms of length to his quadratus lumborum and his erectus spinae and the ability of the psoas to attach where it wants to attach. And then we move over to the guy on the right, it just all goes away. It, it is pretty much as simple as that, it, it all goes away. And more interestingly, uh, so his thighs sink forward and the upper body leans backwards and everyone is free to disagree with me and I have a lot of like still pictures I can show you. Um, I'm not sure if I included any in this PowerPoint, uh, but I take a lot of pictures of people and, they, and I see a lot of people that do this. And I would love it if you guys were to get out in the street and watch people and then don't be too nutty, but take pictures. And maybe you can find some pictures and you'll always find pictures of older people and people with really spinal problems like stenosis that are leaning forward. But I'm looking for like people in their 30s and 40s who are relatively healthy and you're not going to find many who are not in the position of this guy on the right. Um, but what's really interesting about this to me is not only is there an imbalance of flexion and extension, but how do we look at that imbalance that you are, that the guy on the right, and this isn't, you know, this is a, like uh, an image, but he has actually extended his flexors and he's flexing his extensors. So he has turned, it's not that he's turned his extensors into flexors and vice versa, but he is living habitually 
by shortening muscles that are meant to lengthen and lengthening muscles that are meant to shorten. And, and you do that long enough and you're not going to age well, you know? So I skipped ahead a little bit, but what does it have? What does this have to do with pain relief? Um, the thing I want to talk about most today is the position of the pelvis, right? What is the position of the pelvis? And um, the picture on the left of the pelvis is a pelvis that is well stacked. And again, this is an illustration, so it's not like an x-ray of a perfect spine, but your legs are underneath your spine. The legs sit underneath the spine. And the picture on the right is the same is, you know, it's uh, that guy his pelvis with the legs forward and the pelvis pulled forward and tucked under and the lower spine compressed and pulled off to a poor angle. So uh, what I've been, you know, I go through phases and what I'm teaching and what I've been teaching most lately is how do your legs sit into the pelvis, right? How does the femur head sit into the pelvis? So here we're looking at a pelvis and that pelvis has uh, two hips and a sacrum. The hips are the innominate bone, which I love in Latin. It means the bone that has no name. And then there's a sacrum. And the, the, what we're looking at in the, on the side towards the bottom are the acetabulum, the two cups that the femur sits into. So here's your femur. And at the top of the femur, there is a ball. It's a femur. It's a, a ball. And it sits into the socket of the acetabulum. It is a ball and socket joint, and it's meant to be very free. So someone with tight hips is not free in the ball and socket joint, and someone with very open hips is very free in the ball and socket joint. It's as simple as that. But that doesn't really matter to me so much. The question is, how does the ball sit into the acetabulum? How is the femoral head aligned into the acetabulum? So it's not a, a huge... Let's see where we go from there. Um, it's not an incredibly deep cup. If you see this, again, we're looking at illustration, not uh, exact representation, but the ball of the femur head, it sits less than halfway into the cup of the acetabulum, so, and which is actually way more than what you're looking at with the ball and socket joint to the shoulder, which is for another lesson. But everything to me comes down to the simple thing of how does the femoral head align into the acetabulum. So maybe that's hyperbole because I'll say in every lesson and every month that this is the most important thing, but in so many ways, the alignment of the femoral head into the acetabulum determines so much of what happens above and below. And this, what you're looking at here is the iliofemoral ligament, strongest ligament in the body connecting the ilium to the femur. And this ligament needs tone and it wants to hold us in. I don't want to go there yet. Uh, I'm going to skip around. But if you're in the posture of the guy on the right and you're sinking your thigh forward into that uh, ligament, that ligament is not going to maintain its tone. It's going to get stretched out over time. Something I think I'm looking at all the time. It's why it's hard for people to get the, one of the reasons why it's hard to get the thighs back and keep them back. So it is to me the alignment of how the femoral head sits into the acetabulum that determines so much. So uh, I think I've been going on a bit and I, I don't want to, I want to go uh, get through this stuff because I, I might've taken a little too long on the bio portion. So let's, we'll keep going. Uh, you're looking at the three muscles that connect the legs to the spine, right? Three muscles collect the legs to the spine. So as major, Piriform, so is major in the middle top, piriform is bottom left, gluteus maximus bottom right. Three muscles connect the legs to the spine. And they, to me, cannot possibly have balanced tone if the femoral head is not sitting well into the hip socket. And you can see how the, the piriformis attaches on the greater trochanter. Um, the gluteus maximus runs down the outside of the leg. So as attached, so, so as attaches at the front of the body, gluteus maximus and piriformis at the back. And if you are, so it's classic, our feet turn out and our piriformis tightens. That's a very classic habitual pattern. That means you are externally rotating your femoral head and the psoas is going to uh, suffer and vice versa. There's just not many people are too internally rotated, but some are. Um, when the femoral head is not aligned correctly, these three muscles can't get together to balance the body 
and balance the trunk on top of the legs and pelvis. And it is almost impossible from my perspective to get to a good place. So that is why I'm harping so much on how the femoral head sits into the pelvis. The guy on the left has a femoral head that is well aligned in the acetabulum. And the guy on the right um, is externally rotating his femoral head all the time. So what I want you to do is pay attention to what you are doing, not right now. You can do it right now. You can stand up and feel it right now. Um, but more likely five or 10 times during the day, you just stop and you go, what am I doing with the way, where, how are my legs, leg bones sitting into the hip sockets? So I, that my favorite image is screw the legs into your sockets and you can over screw them, right? I, I teach in my class and 10 people are standing there and I watch some people overly internally rotate. Not too many, because you know, but some overly, and then you know, I give them a little uh, freedom to go the other direction. It's, it's, you're finding the right place. You're not only moving in one direction, but again, that the the connection, the uh, alignment of the femoral head into the hip socket is really everything. Um, all right, so now I'm going to show you a picture of the exercise I'm going to talk you through. Uh, some of you guys, I know some of you guys have reached out to me about uh, that exercise is not even an option and you don't have to do this exercise. You can play with the um, with your wrists a little bit, but it's not quite the same as uh, this exercise. But I'm going to talk uh, everyone through this exercise. And this is the um, the balance of flexion and extension. Right. This is a, a, an exercise. This exercise is really about the balance of flexion and extension. I teach this exercise as a fundamental part of the walking program. It's usually in any private I do. It opens up lesson two. It's on lesson two of the walking program videos, and so it's incredibly important to get, do footwork and get your feet moving. We'll have a whole month talking about the foot, and I have a lot to say about feet and mobility and shoes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but this exercise, in addition to being good for your feet, and if you are able to do it, you should probably do it every day, um, it really will tell you a great deal about the balance of flexion extension in your body right away, right? So um, let's get to that right now. So um, and then right away we'll go into questions if anyone has them. All right, so if you have space, you're going to uh, sit down or set up a mat or get on the floor, and I'll give you a few seconds to do that. And you want to come on to your hands and knees to start. You want to bring your knees together and bring your feet together and point your feet and get your uh, – you're going to come to sit on the tops of the feet. Now, I walk myself into this. Now, right away, so I know I got emails from people about uh, worry about – exercises and stuff right away you could put a blanket between the calves and the hamstrings to make this easier if it's really tight but you're going to um come to bring your knees together point your feet and get your heels together so the heels are touching the big toes are touching and your thighs are as parallel as you can and then i literally bring my hands to my buttocks and my try to grab my sit bones and pull the flesh of the butt apart so that i am trying to sit down on the tops of my sit bones, and I'm actually trying to connect my sit bone, uh, catch my sit bone in, catch my heel, so sorry. I'm trying to catch my heel inside of the sit bone. And that makes this a very different pose. Um, I can be accused of cheating in every single yoga class. All I do is look around and see what people are doing. But this is Vajrasana, and most people are doing Vajrasana with the heels splayed wide out apart. You actually want to, this is called Thunderbolt pose, pose for a reason. You want to get those heels inside the sit bones and fire up Mula Bandha and Uda, Uddiyana Bandha, not to get too obscure if you don't know what I'm talking about. So sit on the tops of the feet as best you can. Sit up tall and feel if this is easy or this is hard. And I don't care if it's easy or if it's hard. I just want you to feel how it is. Maybe you're out of it already because I've been talking, but now I want you to feel the difference when you switch and you come up onto the shins and you tuck your toes under, right? And I want you to tuck your toes under 
and you're now trying to get the entire ball of the foot to the floor. Get the ball of the foot to the floor uh, with the toes tucked under or as best you can and then come and sit up on the heels and, and you're going to sit up as tall as you can. You might be pitched forward, but if you can, you're going to sit on your heels and feel which is easier. Is it easier to point your feet? Is it easier to tuck your toes? How much of your toes are tucked under? I'm not going to go back to those pictures of me, but I'm on the ball of my foot. All 10 toes are under. Pinky toe is kind of hanging in space, but I'm on the ball of the foot. And then uh, that seems like it's long enough. We want you to feel that and switch. Come back on to point the feet. Point the feet. Try to get the heels as close to each other as possible and, and try to hook them inside of the sit bones. And again, sit up tall. Uh, try to soften the front ribs down a little bit. And you could even lean backwards and play here. So what I do in yoga classes when I'm uh, teaching this is um, I lean backwards. I put my hands on the sides of my shins. I take my shins up off the floor. And from there, I take my hands up off the floor. And I balance with my hands in prayer. And you're, then you're really balancing on the front of the foot. But that's not necessarily needed for today. Come back up. And uh, last time, last exercise, I want you to switch. Tuck your toes under. And, and so, see again how much of your toes you can get tucked under and sit up on the tops of your feet. They can be, the heels can be slightly apart and feel the difference. So I think that um, can't do this too much as long as you don't have like surgery issues, bunion surgeries and assorted surgeries. Uh, this is just a great, great exercise. Uh, I call it ankles and toes. And uh, you mix that in with, um, rolling a tennis ball under your foot, uh, oh, sort of different foot exercises. I'm a huge fan of foot exercises, but in the context of the balance of flexion and extension, I hope you got some sense of um, uh, which it was, which way it was easier for you, or which way it was harder for you, and, and if that would give you some insight into the work you need to do in terms of your body and your posture uh, in changing it going forward.